Get down with D and D. Yeah, you know me. Get down with D and D. Yeah, you know me. Get down with D and D. Yeah, you know me. Who's down with D and D? Down with D and D. Yeah, you know me. You down with D and D. Yeah, you know me. I'm down with D and D. Yeah, you know me. Who's down with D and D? Hello, everyone. This is Sean Merwin from Downwind D and D. I am here with a very special guest this week, Mr. James Introcaso. Yes, hey Sean, it is awesome to be back on Down with D and D. I love this podcast, and I love Sean Merwin. Well, the love is mutual. I mean, if you've heard our podcast for more than a couple of weeks, you've probably heard James's name mentioned more than a couple of times, <laughs> and there's a reason for that. Because James is an RPG freelancer with credits as long as the Great Wall of China. Uh, <laughs> if you haven't heard of James and you say you're a fan of D&D, shame on you. Because just within the last couple of years, James has worked on WotC products such as Baldur's Gate, Descent into Avernus, Waterdeep Dragon Heist, Waterdeep Dungeon of the Mad Mage, Eberron, Rising from the Last War. And that's just four of many. And... With the Adventures League, on the very same day, not too long ago, two <laughs> adventures from James were released at the, on the same day, Losing Five for the Forgotten Realms AL campaign and Where the Dead Wait for the Oracle of War Eberron campaign. I don't know if that's ever happened before. Two releases on the same day from the same author and in two different campaigns. I don't know. That was uh, uh, and awesome. That was very yeah. cool to, uh, to that it just sort of lined up that way. Uh, and I have to say, working with you on Where the Deadweight might be my favorite experience ever in role-playing games. That was a really fun adventure to write. It, it, it is a fun adventure to play. I've run it a few times now. And the players love it or... <laughs> love hate it right you know what i mean uh, <laughs> yes. but hey but hey for the adventures league you've also worked on several special events including the last two D D opens and an upcoming event that will premiere at gary con which i don't know if i'm allowed to talk about yet but it will be out there in the uh gaming sphere soon yes yeah and i think that will be uh, that may be part of our discussion because i know th some details have been released, uh, so we awesome. can talk a little a little bit about that. I'll probably pull up the listing right now to see how far I can go. Uh. <laughs> yep, and I know it's I know it's up on the GaryCon site, mm -hmm. so there's at least that. And James is also a guild adept, and a uh, veritable treasure trove of D and D guild products have come out of James's mind and fingertips. Uh, the latest, I think, being uh, Abyssal Incursion, Encounters in Avernus, and the very new Hag Malgum. That's right. Yes, yeah. Uh, Hag Malgums is a uh, a very niche product wherein uh, hags are combined with celestial creatures. Uh, so we have like the Hagacorn, which is sort of like a centaur uh, that is a uh, has a hag torso with a unicorn body, and then they also have a horn coming out of their forehead. Um, you know, the the Hagtopus, which is a giant celestial <laughs> octopus uh, cut in half with a hag. So we also have a template to create angelic animals and things like that. Uh, and it's they're very fun, uh, wacky kind of creatures uh, that are all born of a tweet Jeremy Crawford wrote about right. hags riding unicorns. Um, so right. uh, yeah, it's, it was very fun. And Kayla Klein, uh, who is a great artist, uh, did all of the drew all of the creatures for that. Um, and uh, it's I'm really blown away, mostly by the art uh, that is in that mm -hmm. product. So yeah, Sean, I'm basically on the uh, the Sean Merwin path to success. Uh, well, I, I saw well, what you... you have done, and I'm just trying to model that. Uh, uh, and if I'm uh, half as successful, I have made it. Well, I, I have a feeling you're going to be twice as successful if you're not already because uh, I was just going through, like, the list of products that you've put out. And it seems like you just get an idea and then 30 seconds later there's this product there. <laughs> uh, so I don't know how you do it, but God bless you, man. You are you are on a roll. Uh, um, great editors. So, <laughs> so, yeah, there's that. So so we get through your products, which, of course, there are hundreds more. Uh and you also run the Don't Split the Podcast Network mm -hmm. and have an any award-winning blog called the World Builders Blog. 
Yes, yes, I do. Uh, so, uh, yeah, those are, uh, those are sort of what started it all, um, is, uh, the, you know, the blog and, uh, and podcasting have, have started it all for me. And, uh, and then I started to write on my own. Uh, and I feel like that's how I developed my chops is when I was first writing, I put out two blog posts a week. Uh, and I tried to write in the D and D style and that kind of thing. And then eventually, uh, a gentleman named Sean Merwin said, uh, hey, I need some help with some Baldman game adventures would you like to write one uh and i said yes and uh the rest is history history hopefully not that old history (laughs) no ancient history that's true Um, that's true but you know it's it's funny because you and uh james hake both posted a tweet about uh there was a call for adventure writers for the adventures league you know please submit some samples and both you and james uh did that and were rejected if i if i'm reading that correctly yeah yeah so we uh this was before the dm's guild was a thing um mm-hmm. there was uh, the, the adventurers league would have like hey send us samples do a writing test right they would they would also then have like a writing test with like write a you know a room in a dungeon that has a manticore and these things and um and we both did that test and we both uh got rejected from the adventurers league uh, a couple times and honestly uh, looking back on the submission I, I would say rightfully um you know it wasn't uh, it wasn't the strongest submission and the writers that they had at the time were uh you know amazing still are uh, amazing writers who are participating in organized play and watsi publications and all kinds of stuff um sure. so uh, but yeah it was uh, it was very interesting to be like ah so i think the lesson there cuz i also have many rejections from uh, fourth edition days of Dragon Magazine and stuff like that, uh, articles that I had pitched and was rejected is like, don't give up. Uh, no. <laughs> writing and, makes and you better many, at writing, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And there are many, there are all different kinds of needs mm-hmm. um, in, in not just in the RPG world, it's like artists and layout and editing and, and all that. It's just there are different needs within the actual writing. Right. Um, Right, because there's world building and there's monster design and there's power, uh, uh, game mechanical design and adventure design. And so just because you might not fit one niche at one particular time does not mean that you don't will never fit that niche or that there isn't another niche out there for you. Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. There's so much uh, going on. And I think one of the wonderful things about all of these uh, content creator programs, right, like the DMs Guild and, you know, uh, Pugmire has one and Zweihander has one and Rob Schwalb has put up one for Shadow of the Demon Lord um, is that you see all sorts of wacky ideas that uh, take off, right, that do well, that mm-hmm. people obviously want to see, and somebody's making money off of that and and getting their name out there that probably never would get into a, a Dragon Magazine or a, uh, you know, a, a, an Adventurers League publication or that kind of thing because it's like, well, that doesn't fit the, the overall storyline of what we're doing or, or the direction we want to go, but it is still a good idea, right? Um, right. And so it's great to see... Uh, a lot of different ideas uh, and and collaborations uh, coming out of those. Yep. And even putting 10 new potions up Mm -hmm. on the DMs Guild, um, even if it doesn't sell five copies, the process of going through and putting it into a template and having it edited and maybe finding some clip art or some free art to go into it is... You know, it's baby steps, but it's steps that everyone has to take in every project. Uh, so it's good. It's just good practice. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So uh, it is uh, – and it really helps. Uh, this is the thing that I, I always think about. I think one of the things that really helps set your work apart – to someone is uh, is being able to write in in the format of the game that you are writing. Um, mm-hmm. And certainly it's okay to – break that format sometimes uh, but i think you got to know it uh, to break it in a way that you won't then also break the game um sure. <laughs> and so I, I i always encourage people to look at the way things are phrased in a book and it's easy for us to say eh, it sounds good enough right like i i think that's what it is but the book is right there uh, open it up look see yeah. how a, an ability check is written or a, a saving throw uh and you'll be off to the races uh, and then that'll sure. become rote eventually 
And then WotC will now, change it. But, you know. <laughs> well, that, that, there's always that. Always find the most most up-to-date template or the most up-to-date writer guidelines. Uh, right. Yes. Because that's just – it's due diligence for, for your writing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. But the reason that I wanted to talk to James specifically today, despite his wealth of knowledge and, you know, many accomplishments – is that there is a new book about to come out that James worked on. It is called The Explorer's Guide to Wildmount. And James joined a few other writers, mm-hmm. including, I believe it's called uh, Matthew, if, if, I, if, I, if I say this wrong, correct me, Matthew Mercer. Yeah, an up and coming. He's an up and coming writer. Yes. Uh, very, Quite, very yeah. brilliant. Uh, rough, rough talent, yes. you know. But, uh, but yeah, I think you're going to hear his name a lot. <laughs> so that book, based on uh, based in the continent of Wildmount, from the Critical Role campaign setting, uh, will be coming out in roughly a month, two months. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it comes out in uh, March. I want to say March seventeenth. When is St. Patrick's okay. Day? Uh, that's yeah, March. So that, that, that's a month. Yeah. So yeah, that is, and I I believe it comes out on March uh, St. Patrick's Day. So is when it's coming cool. out. Um. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So it'll be here in a month. Uh. Which is pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. So what I wanted to talk to James about more. I mean, I, you you have NDA signed. We don't want to spoil the book. All of that. But I wanted to talk in general about the act of creating. Whether you're a writer or a DM or even a player, the act of creating within someone else's world. Mm-hmm. You know, as DMs or players, we've all played in our own homebrew worlds, and it's great, and we get to do all the, all of that. But there's there's sort of a, or at least I feel like there is a key uh, to being able to create based on someone else's vision. Um, and I just wanted James and I to sit and, and chat for a bit about that. So I want to start, kind of go back with you. How did you get involved in this uh, book? Yeah, that is uh, a great question. So the aforementioned uh, James Hake had worked with Matt on the Taldore Guide, uh, which was mm-hmm. published by Green Ronin. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and that came out, I want to say, like two or three years ago. <laughs> uh, it's, been, it's been a while. Yeah, yeah. So it came out um, – and Joey, uh, or James, was an intern at the time at Geek and Sundry, which is where, uh, man, how things have changed, right? Uh, it's mm-hmm. where Critical Role was uh, broadcasting from at the time before they sort of broke off and started on their own. So, uh, and I think the call had gone out of like, Matt needs some help. Who knows how to write D&D stuff? And uh, he was... James was already the editor of Insider Magazine, right? Um, okay. So anyway, long story short, when Matt started the second book, he wanted to form a team and I think went to Joey and said, I've got some ideas. Uh, do you know anybody else who could help us out with this? Because this is going to be a longer book. We'll, we'll, it's got a shorter deadline. We need some more help. Um, okay. And Joey recommended me. Uh, we had worked together on Dragon Heist and a bunch of other stuff. Um, and so that's uh, that's how the, the – writing team was formed because then Matt also brought in a guy named Chris Lockie uh, who mm-hmm. works for Critical Role full-time doing a lot of production stuff, but he has also written for Cobalt Press and a bunch of other uh, uh, publications. Um, okay. So yeah, so that's how that's how we all came together and then um, I very quickly, uh, so I had not really consumed a ton of Critical Role content. Um, so I very quickly caught up on the second season of Critical Role, which is the one that's currently in production. And at the time only had, I think, uh, about 50, 50 episodes out. So only about 200 hours of content. Uh, <laughs> thank goodness there's double speed on podcasts. Um, so, and that's yes. how I, I caught up as I listened to a lot of the podcasts. Uh, and Matt also had created a primer that we used as well. So, yeah. That is, that is super helpful. Um, so that you kind of covered my next question, which was what kind of research did you have to do to get ready for your role in the publication of this book? Yeah. And so other than other than like reading the primer and listening to 200 hours of podcasts on double speed, uh, it, was there anything else that you felt like you had to do to, to prepare yourself? 
So I think – so those were the, the biggest things and Matt was really open about like, hey, if you have questions, let me know. Um, it, it was a weird situation because, right, there there were sort of like three different buckets of knowledge. There was stuff that everybody knew because it had been on the show um, and uh, – or, or and then there were things that only Matt knew because they were going to be on the show or he had already planned them out but they hadn't been like public facing yet and those were in that document that he shared with us and then there were things that no one knew <laughs> um so right. there were parts of his world where he had like a rough idea of what might be happening in this corner of the map um or or a story element um but didn't know anything else around it and so was asking us to come up with some of those things right um and so the those were the the three different buckets uh the mm-hmm. other form of preparation that i did was i did a lot of uh, sort of reading about what people had written about the uh, – there's a lot of critical role stuff out there. People like to write about it. People like to talk about it. Uh, looking at like what did people think like the themes of season two were as far as the world goes. Like what what makes the world different from the season one world? What makes the world different from the Forgotten Realms and uh, you know Greyhawk and all of the other settings that we know out there? What makes it different? Um, I would ask you, Sean, the same question because when you worked on Acquisitions Incorporated, you had 10 years of content to go through and some of it is in weird places. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's very true. And you know, I, I've had experience over the years in, in something like this. I, I Even um, before – I got too much into game design. I did some work editing on some uh, Babylon 5 projects. Mm-hmm. And so I had to go back and watch all the episodes of Babylon 5. Um, wow. Yeah, which was which was fine. Sure. It, it wasn't horrible work. Uh, and I didn't go through, like, all their novels or anything. But I, I at least got myself into the frame of mind in that way. Mm-hmm. And I did, the same thing with Star Trek. When I worked on the Star Trek book... Um, I specifically went back and watched the TOS, the original series uh, oh. episodes, as well as the the movies from the the original cast, to just to get myself in the frame of mind of. And I didn't really even have to write; I had to write within that world, but it was more just getting the themes down. It was more getting the the tone mm-hmm. than it was actual knowledge of, like. Everyone knows Spock and Kirk. You don't even have to be a Star Trek fan. And if someone says Captain Kirk, they know what you're talking about. Sure, sure. If someone says Mr. Spock, they know what you're talking about. So, um, but for for uh, Acquisitions Incorporated, I I did pretty much the same thing you did. I went all the way back to those original podcasts, and luckily there was a website that had all of them linked to, so oh, I could just click, great. listen, and go. Uh, and that was more. Uh, you know, getting, finding maybe some obscure characters that were mentioned just once or some obscure joke that was made just once and just using those as prompts for new spells or new powers for, um, you know, some mechanical things or uh, Teos did most of the work on sort of the franchise building, but it was the same thing I'm sure uh, with him, which is go back and see what they did sort of in between adventures and and bring that into to this idea of a franchise downtime activity. Yes. Uh, so it, it's it's definitely labor intensive, mm-hmm. but if you're in the right accepting frame of mind, it can be they, those can be great prompts for all sorts of of creative or even rules mechanical work. Mhm. Yeah. At, at least as far that's that was my experience. Yeah, and it really is, right? It really uh I it's funny. I people who uh who don't play a lot of D&D in the Forgotten Realms or Greyhawk, right? Often say what is the difference? They seem like they're the same, right? And I think doing research really helps you find that, wow, these are very different settings. Uh, and it's the same thing, you know, like Critical Role uh, and Acquisitions Inc. could seem like from the outside, well, there's elves and there's magic and, they're, you know, it's all the same. Uh, and they're so very different from uh, other settings and campaign frames that we've seen. Right. 
And and I mean, one of the big differences between what you did and what I did was that I was still working it within the Forgotten Realms. Mm -hmm. the, the The difference for what I did was more tone, and more um, sort of background. Whereas, obviously, again, I don't want you to have to spoil anything or or give away something you're not allowed to. But you know, you are doing more world building. I would guess. Uh, in terms of an actual new setting, yeah. So there, that I think that is true, right? I didn't have your experience, and uh, but I, uh, what is it's fascinating, and I do want to ask you about this because you were building in the Forgotten Realms something that is kind of, uh, you know, you had to make something work in the Forgotten Realms that wasn't originally built in or for the Forgotten Realms um, right. that is a little anachronistic and uh, and mm -hmm. fun and, uh, you know, irreverent. Uh, and so it's you had to make that work in an existing world, right? So you had a world right. within a world, and both of them were things that other people th thought of first that you had to then take the voice on and write it. Um, yeah, yeah. And and it was it was very easy for me to do that because I listened to the show mm -hmm. and because it it's it's different from from between acquisitions incorporated and critical role because in in my case uh, Teos took the C team um episodes and he took the you know took on that role whereas I went back and listened to the other ones so for your work the DM right mm -hmm. Mr. Mercer is the creator right whereas what I was listening to the creators were the players the DM was from wizards right right does, does that make sense yeah so even though even though uh you know, Mr. Perkins, Chris Perkins was was the DM and he is as much a part of Acquisitions Incorporated as any of the players were. He was he was kind of the straight man. Right. In, in comedy terms. Yeah. And the players were the ones that were subverting the tropes of uh, a fantasy. Right. They were the ones that were adding, at least initially, they were adding the business side of things. And he played along with it very well, and he added a lot to it. But at first, right, he was just running a straight D and D uh, keep on the shadow fell fourth edition game. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it, it was easy. I I feel like it's easier, at least it's easier for me to subvert than to actually create. Um, mm -hmm. That's especially when you're talking about comedy, right? Because you you just look at the trope. And then you're like, okay, how can we play with this? Um, whereas creating something brand new, for me, I think is harder because it's deeper. Yeah. Right. People are looking at the deeper stories and the and the connections. Whereas this is, I mean, comedy is hard, but it's hard in a different way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that's what I was going to say. Yeah. Is I don't know that they're 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 just different. They're different ways you prepare, right? They're, one isn't necessarily mm -hmm. harder than the other. Uh, one might come easier to to some people than other because I would rather. Uh, create um, in, in the sense of like I would rather create something whole cloth and not have to worry about the lore sometimes um, mm -hmm. and uh, and I think part of the fun for me is like thinking of what kind of wild thing can I put in this world that still totally belongs in this world and it was good to have Matt there because I think sometimes when you're working with uh, – especially in the case of older worlds, right? Like the creator of Greyhawk uh, is no longer with us, right? So now sure. Watsi has sort of become the guardian of that world, yeah. right? And it becomes harder to make stuff. But when Matt is right there or you know, you can say, I have this crazy idea. Is this OK? And if he says, yes, it's his world, right? And and then right. it becomes his job uh, and and – Watsi's job to be the the guardians, but it's a little easier when the guy who made it is right there, right? Sure, um, sure. So, so that was an advantage, definitely having yeah. Matt there was a was a huge, huge advantage. But the the thing that I like about creating something whole cloth was that we did have Matt to start. Um, mm -hmm. 
And that was really helpful because, you know, uh, there's a section in the book um, about uh, frozen Northland called Isol Cross. Um, and I know this has been talked about, so it's OK for, for me to talk <laughs> about this. Uh, and Matt said, I know these, you know, like five things are happening in Isol Cross and I don't know anything else, but I know more is going on there. And that was kind of it. And it's this collection of frozen islands to the north. And uh, I took that on then. I, I was the one who wrote the initial draft of that. And then everybody, of course, uh, gets in there and, and has suggestions and puts their own spin on things, right? Um, mm-hmm. And uh, and then it gets passed to the Watsi team who does their own development and spin on things. Um and play testers look at it and pick it apart. So at the end, it's not anybody's other than everybody's. Uh, sure. But the thing that was right. fun then about that was it was like, okay, knowing these things are true, what else is true based on that, right? Matt planted mm-hmm. the seeds there. Um, right. And so I didn't ignore those things and I didn't say – well, I have my own idea of what a frozen north should be, and it should be this. Uh, and I'll right. throw Matt's – I'll, you know, like shoehorn <laughs> my ideas into his. It starts right. with, okay, uh, we know a war is going on, right? That's one of the big things in Wild Mount. There's this big civil war that is happening um, that's sort of tearing the continent apart. I guess it's not really a civil war. It's a war between two uh, sovereign nations um, okay. that is tearing the place apart. And it's like, so – if we know that and if we know that up here in the north there are all these ancient artifacts, uh, what else is going on? Well, there's probably some sort of like uh, Indiana Jones-style arms race playing out right. where both sides of the war are looking for the treasures that are buried in the snow and ice there. Um, sure. And so uh, and so, what else is true based on that? And that was sort of how we uh, – yeah. you know, I built out from there. Yeah. So w- was there a lot of like – in person meetings or or you know face to face whether it's via teleconference or or in person uh, about these ideas or was it more someone would iterate one thing pass it along iterate the next thing so there was a lot of uh, there were a lot of meetings we had weekly uh, meetings where we would talk about stuff and we were also checking in with each other on uh, you know email and slack and all of the other ways people communicate through stuff um, and everything for us was written in uh, initially written in Google Docs before it was then okay. brought over into you know style guides and templates and stuff so we could comment and make suggestions and everybody could see and you could also if somebody deleted something that the you know the advantage of google docs is you can go back to old versions if you need to and uh and it's secure and all that kind of stuff so uh it was um essentially we each had our charges right like you're going to write these sections you're going to write these sections but then everybody would weigh in on everybody else's stuff and say when they were ready for people to weigh in because sometimes you're banging out an idea and halfway through it's Oh, this needs to change, or I need—I want to cut this. I'm not happy with it, and you don't need everybody there in the yeah. document saying that as you're going right. through it, right? <laughs> sure, sure. So, based on other Wizards of the Coast products that you've worked on, uh, was that was it pretty similar, or was it different in 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 many or any ways working on uh, this book? So that's a, a great question. Um, there were definitely uh, some similarities, right, in that uh, working with a team and, and collaborating, I think, as part of every project. Uh, but for this product that was uh, – there was more, and I think it's because we were doing a lot more creating as a team from the ground up. Um, and, and that – uh, you know, a lot of times when you write for a Watsi book, Watsi has ideas, right? Like if you sit down mm-hmm. for Descent into Avernus or Dragon Heist, they say, hey, here's the outline. We know what the chapters are going to be. They've done a lot of that development work themselves. Okay. Um, and uh, and in this case, uh, it was – we know that there's going to be a gazetteer. We don't know everything that's going to go in it. We know that there's going to be this, but – and Matt was right. soliciting, you know, like, hey, I need monsters and magic items. What do you guys have? What ideas do you have? What are you uh, going for there? So this felt more uh, more open, I think, um, because we right. were creating a brand new world. Sure. Uh, yeah. So so, so you, you were creating the outline as you went rather than just getting the outline from – 
public. Exactly. And revising the outline, right, as we went. So because right. Matt had to submit something uh, to and, – and honestly, it ended up um, – it ended up too big. Uh, <laughs> there were too many ideas. And I think <laughs> I remember uh, I had some friends who were doing the play test and they said, I just got the play test of this. Uh, it's a 300 page document and there's no art in it. And I was like, oh, well, that's bad. <laughs> that stuff is yeah. getting cut then. Right. Like oh, yeah. there's no way because uh, with art, you've got a, an enormous book then. Uh, so, yeah. Right. Well, I mean, people have said to me and in public it's better to overwrite a little than to underwrite a little. Mm -hmm. uh, overwriting a lot, now that could be a, a problem. But if you're supposed to turn in 10,000 words and you turn in 11,000 words, that gives the editor wiggle room right? Right to to cut things down. But if you are expecting to get te have 10,000 words and you turn in 9,000, then the editor starts cutting things. It ends up being 7,000. Then you're way under. So... Uh, I think a little bit of overwriting is okay. Now, you know, three a three hundred page book without art, yeah, that might be that might be a much. But take a chunk out, and hey, you've got a second book just waiting. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah. Or or a product for the DMs Guild, or a product for our Drive Through RPG, or, or or publish you know a separate book. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So there's a lot of you know, uh, and I think what's nice about a a world book, right, is you can look at things and say, you know, this is a book that has um, not just gazetteer information about the world, but it's got subclasses and it's got magic items and it's got monsters and it's got, uh, you know, uh, all kinds of options, uh, rules options and things like that. And so I think it is easy to look and say, what what needs more time, right? Um, right. You know, like mm -hmm. the Watsi can look and say, these things more need more development or playtesting, so let's take these out. Um, uh, let's have, you know, however many fewer magic items, however many fewer monsters, and if we, if we do another book or if we, uh, you know, want to do, like you said, product uh, online somewhere or, uh, you know, I think – they have that option, right? Matt has that option and, and Watsi has that option. And um, at the end of the day, right, uh, everybody – as a writer, it's important for people to know you still get paid for those words even if they're not sure. used, right? right. Um, as long as you've cleared that ahead of time. You can't just – if you've been asked to write 10,000 words and you show up with 100,000, uh, you can't yeah. demand that. That's not what you were contracted right. for, right? <laughs> pay, pay, pay me 10 times what you promised. <laughs> Yeah. Usually usually does not work well. It does not. It does not work well. And you just made 90,000 words of work for an editor. So, uh, yeah, you know. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, when you were working on Ack Inc., Sean, um, mm -hmm. I am curious to know, uh, so your, how did you determine kind of what the book would be because you have a lot of great world building information. You have a lot of great uh, information about like running a franchise, what that's like as characters. Um, but then also uh, there's like a pretty meaty adventure in that book as well. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I mean, th that kind of goes along with what you were talking about with, uh, you know, what's going to be in the book. We, we didn't have to do a lot of the world building because we early on in the project decided well, we, we didn't know where we could set it mm -hmm. at first because at first this was going to be a Kickstarter. Right. Um, and so we we you can't use the I, Wizards IP unless you are publishing directly through Wizards or through the DMs Guild. So we're like, okay, if we're going to do a Kickstarter, we either need to get special permission from Wizards to do the Kickstarter or we need to set it in a world of our own. So we were wrestling with ideas are we going to create our own world are we going to partner with another publisher to create in their world how is this going to happen so you know we started with ideas that weren't contingent on that ip and and then as the process went along we finally realized we were going to be allowed to write in the forgotten realms one way or another so let's Let's decide where we're going to set this adventure, which we knew would be a, a good part of the book, right? Because that's what Acquisitions Incorporated is, right? It's about the adventures that they go on. Um, and so we kicked around ideas of do we set it in somewhere completely different than Forgotten Realms that haven't been touched uh, by Wizards in, for 5th edition? Um, there's lots of great 
realms material out there, lots of great places that we could do this. But we decided to kind of go the nostalgia, if nostalgia can be only like three years old, um, the nostalgia route of let's touch on places that adventures I've already taken people and we'll put our own little twist on things. So the so with that in mind, we just brainstormed, okay, where have we seen adventures so far? Well, we've seen them in Waterdeep. Okay, let's set part of the adventure there. Uh, the uh, Fandelver is a place that has been visited many times. So let's let's set a piece there. Uh, Neverwinter is a place that is gets a lot of uh, use in video games, in books, in adventures. Okay, we're going to go there. Where has the uh, A team and the C team been? All right, that's going to be where we go to. So we decided to go back to the places that either got uh, lots of use so far in 5th edition or where one of the either A team or C team have been. And so that, and once that was done, it kind of made it easy because we just go look what's happened there. All right, now let's put our twist on it. So, you know, so Fandelver becomes, it's usually the starting point for, you know, the very first box set that was released, uh, Lost Minds of, of Fandelvin. Um, uh, sure. I'm sorry, Fandelin. And, uh, okay, so we're going to put our, our Ack Inc. twist on that. You're going to start a franchise there. And you're going to meet the people that you've met before, maybe, when you first started 5th edition. But now you're going to come at, come at it from this other angle of trying to get one over on them as a business person. Mm. Mm. And mm. so, you know, so, so that was, that was the bulk of the book. And then we just went and said, okay, what rules can we add that are useful for players, but also have this sort of twist. Yes. So like I went all the way back to the very first fourth edition Ack Inc. Um, adventures and, uh, like Jim, Jim Dark Magic would, well, first of all, he was casting Magic Missile, the fourth edition Magic yeah. Missile, where you had to roll an attack roll. Oh, right. So I was like, okay, that has to be a spell, right? Because Jim's first, Jim Dark Magic, first Magic Missile, he rolled an attack roll for. <laughs> so we have to add a spell called Jim's Magic Missile that you have to roll an attack roll for. Uh, and then one of the first things uh, he tried was casting light on a coin and throwing it into the room to distract someone. And if you've DM long enough, you've played long enough, you see people, players trying these little tricks, right? Mm -hmm. And then you as the DM have to decide how is this going to work. So I was like, no, I'm going to make the spell that these people are trying to use. <laughs> so so we get Jim's glowing coin, right? So it's it's both a light spell and a distraction spell. Mm. And and it it does what Jim was trying to do in that in that very first uh, adventure. So yeah, it was those things that I was looking for to give both a new thing for players to use plus touch back on the actual play that was going on in these Acquisitions Incorporated games as far back as even 4th edition. Uh, so how we decided was we decided as we went along, okay, based on the business model that we now have, which is a Kickstarter, what can we do? Oh, Wizards is going to publish the book. Well, based on what Wizards uh, wants to publish, we're going to have to switch gears and let's try it in this direction. Because things like subclasses or uh, you know larger sort of game mechanical bits are harder to play test, are harder to gauge how they work without a lot of time and a lot of development. And we didn't have a lot of time and development. So all of that sort of deeper rule stuff we had to pull from the book and completely understandable. Uh, but that uh, opened up room to do some other cool things. Uh, like if you are playing these certain classes in uh, Ack Inc, here are some ways that you might want to go uh, about playing that class with this sort of financial dark humor bent. Mm hmm. Yeah, it feels very um, <laughs> uh, it, it feels as someone who has been in corporate offices, right, and worked in right. corporate offices, it, it feels written by someone who has been there and, and the jokes that should be made uh, in a great yeah. way, really, really fun way. Right. Well, I mean, Te Teos Abadia uh, was the original co-author with with me and um, Scott Fitzgerald Gray 
mm. came in to edit and also started adding content as well. And then, of course, you had everyone at Penny Arcade, right? Jerry and Alyssa and all of the uh, players who added their little bits to it, um, you know, come from different backgrounds. But a lot of them live in that corporate world, right? Teos is, is an environmental attorney. I was a software project manager uh, and technical writer and QA engineer for 20 years. So we've all been through that sort of corporate grind the the dark humor that that is the life of many people out there working in these worlds um and so a lot of people can appreciate the D D for being you know good solid D mechanics but also having this sort of whimsical and sometimes frustratingly real uh background to the game Mm-hmm. where you're trying to get up this corporate ladder while, while people are kicking you in the face. Yeah, yeah. And so th- this was the other thing that I wanted to talk to you about because I think the Ack Inc. book is probably, for me, uh, the most fun book to read and, like, the mm-hmm. best written book because it has such a distinct voice. Uh, mm-hmm. And I think that is a huge thing that we often overlook in – writing role-playing games books because they tend to be pretty Mm. technical, right? And they can read more like textbooks. But I think voice is a huge thing. And when you're working in someone else's world, especially Mm. as a collaboration, uh, writing in the voice of that world and the voice of the creator usually, um, that is a challenge in and of itself. And it's one that I talk about a lot uh, in my other job, right? I write and produce a lot of TV promos, and promos are written in, quote-unquote, the voice of the network, right? So if you're on the voice of National Geographic is different than the voice of PBS, which is different than the voice of the Discovery Channel, right? And even though sure. they all have similar content, um, their, their promo, their marketing voice is different. Uh, the same way mm-hmm. – in a writer's room for a TV show, uh, you have all these writers, but they all have to write with the voice of the head writer and the, uh, usually the creator of the show. Um, yep. That is not an easy thing to do, especially when you're, you have your own voice and you're used right. to writing possibly in somebody else's voice. Uh, how was it established for Ack Inc.? It, it was established very early uh, because Jerry Holkins, his voice is so distinct, mm-hmm. right? I mean, if you you only have to hear Jerry talk or play or DM for about twenty minutes, and you realize what that voice is and how distinct it is and and how unique it is, and so I. I was the first project I worked on that was actually a Penny Arcade product was something that they ran at PAX West, maybe in 2016, I want to say. And they, uh, Wizards came to me and said, We want you to write four short, was it four, six, something like that, short adventures, but we want it set in the Forgotten Realms. But these are going to be Ack Inc. interns playing them. So make them in that voice. And I, did the best I could. You know, I went, I did my due diligence. I, I listened to the podcasts, real, figured out what the voice was. It didn't take long, very distinct, hilarious to use. Boom, it was done. And I just turned it over. I didn't go to PAX West. It, I, it ran. I was home, you know, mowing my lawn or whatever. And uh, Teos Abadia, who was DMing there, said, I actually met Jerry in, in, at a hotel bar and he loved what you did. And Teos, that that um, con also wrote Cloud Giants Bargain, mm. which is another Ack Inc. Uh, product that they gave away to people that went to the live stream um, that was in theaters. And so Teos talked with Jerry about you know what he wrote, what I wrote, and you know Jerry was just over the moon with us being able to capture the voice that he was going for. And so I. I just thought, okay, great. I, I did a thing and it was good and, and off we go. And, uh, you know, a couple of years later, the, the steam, the momentum finally got built up enough to write it. But it's, it's a, if you, like I said, if you listen to Jerry long enough, it's impossible not to, to think in that voice. You know, it's like if you hear someone with an accent and suddenly you start talking in that accent because it's just, it just drills itself into your head. 
uh, that's what it's like with Jerry and, and his tone with games, mm-hmm. right? It just, you can't not do it um, because it's so unique. So it, it wasn't terribly difficult to capture that voice. And I think, you know, I think Teos and I came at it in, in such a way, and we had talked a lot about it uh, even before we started writing. Uh, and then uh, Scott Gray picked it up immediately as the editor and was able to to bring it home. And then, of course, Jerry uh, and Alyssa Grant, who was the overseer for this whole project, uh, went through everything and, and made whatever tweaks they needed to do, got the additional work from from the Ack Inc. Uh, players for their their contributions and put it all together. And I think they just handed it over to Wizards and, and Wizards probably just looked at it and like, yep, that's Ack Inc. Here we go. <laughs> Uh, so, so I was going to ask you a very similar question in that, uh, you know, how, how was writing in, in a way that captured the imagination of probably the most well-known DM in the world? (laughs) Yeah. Well, no pressure. I mean, but I, I have to say it's the, it was the same experience of like doing the research and uh, Matt writes uh, often how he speaks when he is uh, DMing a game of critical role. Right. And, and having his document, having the Taldere guide to look at. Right. Uh, And also having, um, all of him in your ears and in front of your face, uh, you know, speaking the way that he does, it was like, oh, okay, this is good. And then we would talk about it uh, in our first meeting. I remember we, we talked about like, how do we want this book to sound? And, and we want it to be a book that is, um, you know, uh, the kind of book that you would read aloud during uh, like, like as a story to people, right? Yeah. Uh, like sort of like in, old timey orator, uh, you know, uh, speaking or, or telling a story for a crowd, that kind of thing. Um, so it was like, okay, we want this to have this sort of epic, uh, gripping language, right. That, that makes people feel like they're reading a story, not just reading a textbook or that kind of thing. And it should be in the style of Matt Mercer. You know, Matt likes to evoke, um, mm-hmm. a, a lot of senses and that kind of thing. I would often say that Matt speaks in the way, uh, we think of good box text, um, yep. you know, uh, which we don't need to get into the controversial box text opinions. No. Uh, but no, th- we could have another whole episode and probably will. At some <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But we we can agree, right, that there is well written box text. Um, sure. And uh, and Matt, you know, writes a lot of read aloud text for critical role uh, that he will then read, you know, to set the scene for his players and that kind of thing. And that's, uh, you know, what we wanted to do is uh, we wanted you when you read the book, we wanted it to draw you in like it's telling you a story and that you could not just see in your mind what was going on, but you could hear Wild Mountain, and smell Wild Mountain, and, and feel all the various temperatures and that kind of thing. Um, so we went we leaned in that direction Um you know, and again, right, I, and I'm sure you had the same experience too. Like, bearing in mind, it is also going to be published by Watsi and needs to fit with the other D and D books, right? In in sure. some way, yes. and so you you have to negotiate that. And obviously, that's why I was saying about uh, at the beginning of the show, right? Uh, learning the rules and the format so that you know how can I play within this format so that it's still D and D. Right. And it's still skill checks and rules are all written in a way that they still make sense. Um, But I need to really evoke the flavor of this magic item. And Mm -hmm. uh, and so I I need to also keep in mind Wild Mountain, that style. And can I marry the two? Um, Mm -hmm. You know, and and the answer is you can. Uh, It takes a lot of work and it takes uh, (laughs) usually takes some very good editors. Uh, Guys like, um, you know, you mentioned Scott Gray. Hannah Rose also worked on the Wild Mountain book Mm -hmm. along with Scott. Um, and uh, and having them there, you know, to be able to to guide that and and watch that the marriage of those two things coming together is really important. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing when you write to see a really great editor at work mm-hmm. is is it's a thing of beauty. It's a symphony um, when, where they can totally understand the what they're going for at the end. And sometimes, and most times editors have more of a feel than you as the writer do, especially if it's a project with a bunch of different contributors Mm -hmm. to, to see them take that, 
you know, take the baton and bring all of those instruments together in a way that forms something beautiful. It's, 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 it's beautiful to watch. Uh, and especially, you know, people like Scott and, and Hannah Rose who, who, you know, are, are great at their craft. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's really, and it, and it shows you the value of having outside perspectives and, and expertise, uh, on a, on a project like that. Um, it really just, mm-hmm. it makes a world of difference. Yep. Yeah. Anything else that you want to add about uh, the Explorer's Guide to Wildmount? Um, so I do think it's a uh, it's a good look uh, into this world if you are not familiar with it too. I think that's mm-hmm. the big thing. Is uh, we when we were writing this, we had the approach of this needs to be a book that Critical Role fans will appreciate, right? And they're going to appreciate it because it's Critical Role and it's a well-made product with Matt Mercer's voice in it, right? And and with his right. words, he, you know, like, make no mistake, no one has worked harder on that book than Matt Mercer. Um, right. So, it, you know, it's it's going to draw them in. But we also need to keep in mind that this is a book that it's a chance to introduce people to this world who maybe don't have the four hours a week to watch Critical Role or the desire to watch actual plays for whatever reason. Um, yeah. It should still be an interesting world to play in if you've seen nothing. And it should be a good introduction to that world if you've seen nothing related to Critical Role. And I do really think that we achieved that. That was, has been a goal from before I was even brought in on the project. That was a goal. Um, Mm -hmm. And that's something I would tell people to keep in mind, right? You are going to go in and have done all this research if you're working on a project like this. But uh, you need to keep in mind then that the people who are jumping in, you did the research so they didn't have to, right? Um, Mm -hmm. Sure. And uh, and it should be really accessible. And like I – pick up the book and when i was reading sections other people wrote it was like oh i want to i want to run a game over here now or i want to use these items in my game that you know someone else created uh and that was a good feeling um and i think it's really important when you're making a product uh and i think the ack inc book does the exact same thing uh it introduces people to the world in a way that you don't have to have any prior knowledge of critical role. You don't need to know who Matt Mercer is. You don't need mm-hmm. to know uh, what wild mount is before you crack open the cover and read this. Um, I think there's a lot of great stuff in there and there's a lot of great stuff in there. That's not in the show yet. Um, so, right. uh, some stuff I assume may never make it into the show. You know, the characters may choose to never go to ISIL cross uh, sure. and, uh, and uh, hopefully someone still gets a lot out of that. So well, I'm sure that they will, because, you know, even, even DMS that, as you said, aren't into critical role DMS are scavengers at heart, right? They want to tell the best story they can tell and if they can pull a piece from this and a piece from that and and create their own uh, hag amalgam I'm sorry amalgam <laughs> of uh of their for their own world they will steal from anything and and I say that with all respect because I am exactly the same way right you can grab an idea from anywhere and I know that looking at the creators of this book from Matt to the 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 two Jameses mm-hmm. uh to Chris Lockie and all the love that has definitely gone into this book from from fans who, you know, were just fan artists who are now published artists because of this book. Um, you know, all that love that went into it will make it a great product. Yeah, yeah, uh, I agree. Uh, and if you uh, like Ack Inc., uh, hopefully we, we rise to that level because I really do think that is uh, maybe the best book that's been written for 5th edition so far. Um, so Well, I Wow. Okay. Uh, You heard it from James. That's right. James said it. It must be true. (laughs) Well, I want to thank everybody out there who supports our show. Thank you for listening. And I want to thank James for uh, coming onto the show to to talk about his work. Yes. Uh, Thank you so much for having me, Sean. I really, really appreciate it. And I love the podcast. Uh, So it's great to be here. Thank you for that. Now, 
if people want to follow you on the social medias, James, where might they go? So you could go to Twitter. I am at James Intracasso. Uh, and you can also head on over to worldbuilderblog.com, um, where I blog pretty much about all the game design stuff I do. Uh, and also now jamesintracasso.com uh, also has uh, a bunch of my uh, role-playing game work as well as my television work. So, uh, yeah, you can check wow, stuff out. Wow, look at that. There. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, if you need any television work done, you know where to go. <laughs> Thank you. So, Thank you. Yeah. So, so uh, I am Sean Merwin. You can find me on Twitter at Sean Merwin. Um, if you want to follow the show, you can go to at Misdirected Mark. We also have new forums, forums.misdirectedmark.com, where you can ask us questions or talk about any of the shows that are on the network. And you can also just go to misdirectedmark.com, where you can download all of the shows. Uh, I am going to be at a couple of shows coming up. I want to let people know that I will be at BFG Con in Frederick, Maryland from March 13th through 15th. I'll be running games and sitting on a couple of panels, including one with Mr. Mike Sly Flourish Shea. Oh, never heard of him. We, never heard of him. Never heard of him. <laughs> um, where, where he will be berating me for adventures that he's played that I've written, and I will be sitting in the corner eating carrot cake. <laughs> um, I, will, I will also be... Oh, sorry. Go oh, ahead. I, I will also be at Gary Con in Lake yes. Geneva, Wisconsin from March 26th to 29th, running games and sitting in on a panel or two. James... Are you going to be at any of those? Yes, I will also be at GaryCon, uh, where you can actually get a preview uh, of Wild Mount. Um, so there will be an adventure there uh, that I wrote um, that is a competitive adventure. Uh, it's sort of like the D&D Open. It's uh, not as long. Uh, it's a, a four-hour adventure um, on Thursday night um, that takes place in Wild Mount. Uh, so whether you're itching to play because you just got your book or you're you're not sure and you want to check it out that's a great event to go to there are pre-gens um you don't need to bring a character uh, and it uses a bunch of options from the book to create those characters so you can jump right in it's pretty great sweet and since james mentioned that i will mention that one of the events at gary Con is a competitive event that i also worked on with celeste conowich that is set in eberron yes with pre-generated characters so if you are want to get your competitive D D on you will have many options to play premiering at gary con excellent um, and with that i will thank you all for listening um we will be back again next week with more great content on down with D D. but james i need to ask you what are we going to do now uh, you know what, Sean? I think we are going to go kill some monsters. Very nice. Get down with D&D. Yeah, you know me. Get down with D&D. Yeah, you know me. Get down with D&D. Yeah, you know me. Who's down with D&D? Who's down with D&D? Yeah, you know me. You're down with D&D. Yeah, you know me. I'm down with D&D. Yeah, you know me. Who's down with D&D? Yeah, you know me.